Hi folks, I'm Father Joe Grimaldi. You can call me Joe, and I'd like to welcome you to my podcast. But now, here's our host and friend, Ken Calvert. Hi everybody, and welcome to the Father Joe Grimaldi podcast, proudly supported by Hoot McInerney Star Lincoln, located at 12 Mile Road and Telegraph in Southfield. Stop on by, say hi, or visit their website at starlincoln.com. Have a look at their huge selection, including the Lincoln MKC, same vehicle that Father Joe and I are now driving. Ooh, love that car. Love it. 2019 North American International Auto Show is here, and you are going to be blown away with the Lincoln display. you got to stop by the booth and check that out. Stop by Hoot McInerney Star Lincoln, 12 Mile Road and Telegraph, or visit StarLincoln.com. Friends, today's podcast needs a little bit of a setup. Father Joe and I sit down in the studio and we we get to talking before we actually literally go three, two, one, and he says six, five, four. And then I start with, hi everybody and welcome to the Father Joe Podcast. I'm Ken Calvert alongside my dear friend, Father Joe Grimaldi. Well, on this past Wednesday, you can gather that Joe is not here right now. We were chatting about a gospel I had read that confused me, and I'm going to read that gospel to you later in the podcast because it comes up. Now, here's my frustration and why I'm often confused. I told Father Joe that I wish I could better understand what to take from the liturgy when my starting point is often one of confusion and I find myself scratching my head. So like I said at the top, as we often do, we just start talking before we really start recording. And I loved where we were going with this, so I just hit the button that says record. Oddly enough, we finish this up, and I receive an email from a woman named Patty. And I'm going to read that to you right now, okay? Patty writes, Dear Mr. Calvert, in the interest of full disclosure, I'm a longtime friend of Father Joe's. He knew me before I was born. I enjoy the podcasts, and I'm learning a ton. I have a question that I'd like addressed, if possible, for Ash Wednesday, which is on March 6th. The readings for Ash Wednesday always talk about how one should not perform righteous deeds and show them to others. And then she includes the readings. I have never understood these readings in the context of getting ashes and walking out of the church with them, a symbol that would seem to be in direct contradiction to the readings at hand. I hope that you can give this topic a whirl to the start of Lent. Thanks so much, Patty. Well, Patty, I didn't want to wait till Lent because it fit in so nicely with what we're doing here today. Because not unlike you, Patty, I get confused as well. So what I'm going to do now is pick it up from exactly where it started on Wednesday at just about 11.30 in the morning, and it sounds like this. There is such a group of people that are called fundamentalists, and you're familiar with that. Of course. Where they interpret everything in the Bible the way it is said. You know, Jonah spending three days in the whale. Exactly. In the stomach of the whale. Noah's Ark. You know, Noah's Ark, all of these things. Well, you could go and say that it actually did happen the way it's said, or you could try to understand what the author is trying to tell us. Right. And so that you achieve the same goal. The reason I say that is because there are people who certainly will interpret literally what is being said. We can't condemn them. For all we know, they're right. Who knows? But but by the same token... <laughs> you, you raise a good point. Who knows? <laughs> Who knows is we, right. We find out so, when that light switch goes. That's right. That's right. So, you know, I, I mentioned to you once before, in Rome, there is one whole university. It's called the Biblicum. Mm-hmm. It's been there for many, many years. Right. It's made up of Jews, Catholics, and Protestants. And all they do is interpret Scripture. And that's the Scripture that we rely on. We want their interpretation. So they study that for a lifetime. And when they die, somebody else is going to continue. Boy, I don't know if it took the podcasts or whatever 
to bring this portion of it out of me. Yeah. And by it, I mean interpretation, making the biblicum part of my DNA. Yeah. Okay? That's actually the best way I can describe it. Imagine me, my universe, Ken Calvert, Catholic, taking the principles of the biblicum and putting it into my life in church hearing scripture and then saying let's break this down ken sometimes i find it to be a little bit of a hollywood movie sometimes i find myself drifting in that direction we just did with the baptism where god the father comes out and boom how do we know how it happened clap of thunder or was it intimated so that's where i am with this you being a priest i look to you to basically act as the biblicum for me the instructor to bring it out and go okay let me make this simple for you here's how this works i wish i were that smart but anyway let you, me say and this. you are though no. you're the best no one once we we say hollywood <laughs> to me, i'm turned off that was a metaphor i realize that but it's a very harsh one why and I'll tell you why why I'm turned off to this way. This is important. That. All right, it is important. Yes. But Hollywood just bothers me a little bit. And I'll tell you why. It's scripture. It's holy scripture. Maybe it doesn't have to be interpreted exactly the way it is uh, because the writers use literary techniques. And when they use literary techniques, you can have a little bit of liberty in the way you interpret things. But when I hear the word Hollywood... It cheapens the idea of scripture. And to me, you know how you kind of feel a little bit, I don't know what the word is, but... I don't know, uncomfortable? Uh, yeah, uh, a little uncomfortable. Yeah. I know what you're saying, but by the same token, applying it to scripture bothers me a little bit. I, I didn't mean to... And I don't mean we don't can't uh, put that in no, here. No, right? no, I didn't mean to trivialize no, it. But Hollywood trivializes it. Well, it was, it was a manner of me expressing what I was talking about. Yeah. In terms of, in movies, oh, I saw the Ten Commandments, you know, Charlton Heston goes up on the mount, you know, mm -hmm. and uh, there's a burning bush, and he looked like this before he went up, and he looked like that after he came down. Yeah. But that's how they interpret it. And not only that, some people firmly believe it. That's where I'm going with this. Yeah. That's why I'm wondering sometimes the Biblicum, which we mentioned earlier, Sure. You to me, you're the biblicum. You're the guy that okay. brings the interpretation to me, given all of the various sides that we can interpret. I try to do the best I can. You do do a great job of it. So mm -hmm. I'm going back to the, the, the podcast, sure. the baptism of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, okay? Correct. I understand that. On our last podcast, and I have it right here, you said this. The other thing is that during the baptism of Jesus, there's a voice from up above that is very loud and clear. This is my beloved son, and I take great pleasure in him. I think it sort of tells us that we better watch him, see what he has to do. He has a really special mission, and it begins with the baptism of the Lord. He has the mission to spread the word of God as much as he can by word and by example so that this is the mission that's given to him and the Lord God the Father is pleased with him when I hear you say there was a voice from up above God the Father it's already confusing with the Trinity you can see why I'm confused you can see why I'm a head scratcher I wonder how the event took place and what it was like. The only thing I could think of is that it, it, it does take a great deal of study, and this is where I have a lot of respect for the Biblicum, okay, because mm -hmm. it goes on and on and on. After we're dead, they're going to still interpret. But the whole idea is that a very important event took place. You as a writer, how would you express that? Well, you might say, well, God finally speaks out. And he says, this is my beloved son, in whom I am well pleased. Now, did he actually do that? Or was there another way he conveyed that in the hearts of the people? 
who now see Jesus being baptized, in other words, beginning his mission on this earth. And so they feel, yes, he's been blessed by God, and God has given him. You know, it's one of these things that's even more confusing when you think of the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, three separate persons, but one God. I mean, that's mind-boggling. That's wor- I mean, you know what? You took the words right out of my mouth. you got to have faith. You have to have faith on that. And so here's God praising God, as it were. Maybe not. Who knows? But the thing is... Then you have the Son of God. Yes. You and have then three, you have the Holy Spirit. Yeah, but you have three different persons. Right. And they're supposed to be different, but one Ergo God. Ergo the Trinity, correct? Yeah, one God, the Trinity. So yeah. in any case, I... I I, I think the only thing is that the the only thing that really took me back a little bit, you like that term, was when you said Hollywood, because to me, that trivializes Scripture, and Scripture is too important to be trivialized. Now, you can talk about it and say, how does the Biblicum interpret that? Do they even interpret it? Which I think they do. Um, and can that happen in different parts of Scripture? Yes because the people who wrote scripture were writers and if they're good writers they're going to use good interpretive uh how should i put it literary techniques Mm -hmm. because they want to get across their idea of faith they want to get across their idea of this wonderful god their wonderful jesus the wonderful spirit so they want to get that across so they have to come up with something that is going to touch hearts it's a compelling tease as we call it in radio terrific you absolutely have to have that compelling tease that brings people back to the next stage of the liturgy sure it's like coming up next sunday guess what jesus christ is baptized and this story is really good it's coming up one week from today in radio, we're guilty of that all the time. I'm not guilty. That's good. Well, it is, because you want to keep people yeah. interested. Sure. And involved. Correct. And you want them to join the conversation. You know, what about the meteorologists that do that all the time? Yeah. Is it going to snow tomorrow? <laughs> Are we going to have a slippery drive? <laughs> That's right. <laughs> I'll have that for you. In yeah, at just 5 a, o'clock. <laughs> oh, now they've even gotten specific about, I'll have that for you at 5.17. Yeah. And it's like, okay, yeah. well, i got to get this done before 5.17. So the applications are everywhere. And that's where I'm going right now, in the pew, in the church, during the liturgy. You know, it reminds me of the gospel that we were talking about a few weeks back, uh, the Feast of St. Anne Seton. And I want to read this to you. As they were going along the road, someone said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, Foxes have holes, and birds have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. To another he said, Follow me. But he said, Lord, first let me go and bury my father. But Jesus said to him, Let the dead bury their own dead. But as for you, go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Another said, I will follow you, Lord, but first let me say farewell to those at my home. Jesus said to him, No one who puts his hand on the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. All right, simply put, I am confused. I am scratching my head. I don't know if you remember this, but we kind of got back and forth on I remember this. it well. Okay. I mean, the whole important thing of that My of interpretation th- was, uh-uh. I'm going back to bury my dad. It's important that I be with my family at this particular time. Yeah, the example was lost then. The whole idea is following Jesus is so important that nothing should stop you from following him. Does that mean you don't bury your dad? No, it doesn't mean that. But if I want to get that point across, don't forget, they want to use literary technique that shakes people up. They're going to say, you can't even bury your father so it's that important right does it mean you don't bury no i don't think it means that but you understand where i'm going with this entire discussion that we've just all of a sudden opened up with a live mic and you looked at me and said we're not recording but no i think it's important because 
there are many, many, many people out there that really want to sit down in the pew and come out of this, and they do. Again, I'm compartmentalizing us as a group of Catholics, Uh and that's unfair to do. I I do want to mention this, and I wish I were more of a literary person um, who could express more clearly. You do, though. Don't worry about it. Well, I'm trying, but anyway, uh, you know, the whole idea of the book of faith, that's what the Bible is, the book of faith. It's not a book of facts, never meant to be a book of facts. And I think this is what people have to keep in mind. Whatever examples are used are to bring out a very important point that's being made. So, for example, when you put your hand to the plow, you don't turn back. Yes and no. What does that mean? It means that this is a very important thing to do is to follow Jesus. It's so important that other things should not take place instead of it. It doesn't mean you don't bury your father. It doesn't mean you don't turn your back on the plow. But it means that following Jesus is very important. Mm -hmm. The same thing when Jesus calls his apostles. They drop everything and follow him. Do they drop everything? I don't know. But the thing is this. That was so important that they did follow him. How they did it, I don't know. What they did before they followed him, I don't know. But that is what they're trying to get across. So, keeping in mind that the scriptures are really a book of faith, not of facts. And this is why you could point out throughout scripture all sorts of facts and quotes that are incorrect, yes. But that's not what they're trying to do. They're trying to bring across a very important point, and that's faith. I really like this discussion because it reminds me of sort of a town hall with just the two of us. Yeah. You know, and I wish I had some other people uh, sitting around us right now going, oh, oh, right. That's the sound of, of adults raising their hands. Interested going, people. Yeah, going, call on me next, call on me next. What did the Lord mean when he said, I want to take a, a simpler meaning from each and every time I go to Mass. I don't have to yeah. always come out of Mass saying, I could do better, do I? Can I uh, say this to you mm-hmm. as someone who's, and I'm not being funny, an expert in the area of uh, broadcasting and so on? Mm-hmm. Don't you always say you want to do better? <laughs> yeah. You know, I knew you were going to do that. I just had a flashback to sitting down with the program director and him saying, yeah, it was a great show, but it could have even been better. Yeah, I I think, you know, for example, there are people that really think they're doing such a great thing because once a year they serve the homeless with turkey dinners. (laughs) Right. Can't they say, what can I do to really help these people? (laughs) Right. (laughs) Now, I don't mean to take away from that. No, uh, but you're dead on. uh, But it's true to me to see people who feel that they're doing this wonderful thing. Oh, I'm going to be spending all day on Wednesday, the day before Thanksgiving, (laughs) because we're preparing to give out 400 dinners, turkey dinners to the people. Do you think that's going to help the homeless? I mean, (laughs) so anyway, what I'm saying is we could all do better. We could do better with our lives. We could do better with interpreting scripture. We could do better with all of these things in broadcasting. All of us could do better. I think it was a great discussion. And I think it's one that I would like to have more of because of the fact that I find it, you've taken me from a place where we just started talking about you, a priest, a retired priest, what we're doing now, let's do a podcast. Now I'm all in, and thank you for that. I'm all in. And what I'm trying to do is come out of it now with a better understanding of how I can take the liturgy through a good friend of mine who's also a priest. This podcast, ladies and gentlemen, today was for me. It was for me to ask Father Joe personal questions, and I took you inside my house, my studio, to ask my questions, and I hope you all appreciate it what I tried to accomplish selfishly for hopefully not just me, but for all of us. I preach with the idea of learning myself so that whenever I do preach a homily on Sunday, 
I'm preaching first and foremost to me. It's not just to you because we all have goals to achieve. We can always do better in everything that we do. So it's all of us that are in this together. So anyway, I'm hoping that this touches people the way Ken just mentioned, uh, the way you just mentioned, Ken. And uh, I'd love that we can continue to do this. But thank you very much. Now, I want to thank everybody for joining us on the Father Joe Grimaldi podcast, brought to us, supported by, proudly, Hoot McInerney, Sterling, and 12 Mile Road and Telegraph in Southfield. Stop on by, say hi, and make sure you get the Father Joe star treatment. Special treatment, and see you soon. All right, so long, everybody. This is Father Joe Grimaldi, and I look forward to seeing you next time on the Father Joe Podcast. If you'd like, you can email us. It's F-R-J-O-E-P-O-D-C-A-S-T at gmail.com. That's F-R-J-O-E-P-O-D-C-A-S-T at gmail.com. We're also on Facebook. Simply search Father Joe Grimaldi. And thanks for listening, everyone.